Good morning. I'm going to start talking because I have a lot to talk about. So please find a seat. Come up here. Sit down. Seriously, you can come up. You can have like a campfire type deal. Uh, just please come sit. Don't stand. I'm going to be talking a lot. All right, I'm going to get rolling. Here we go. Uh, you're in the GraphQL way talk. Uh, you're also, let's see if this works. Oh, hey, here we go. I got it to work. My phone works. You have to reconsider the basics track at RailsConf 2018. Uh, that's the last keynote animation I'll subject everyone to. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have a lot of gifts in my talk this year, uh, but I do have these really cute animals, so you're going to have to deal with me. Can I take, no. If I take this mic off, will it be a problem? My audio crew? Yeah, can I have that? Hey, hey, there we go. Hey, hey, thank you. I appreciate that. OK, my name is Q Rush. Um, I'm Nick Caranto. Uh, you can find me on the internet at Q Rush on Twitter. I used to have that Instagram account, and then I deleted my account out of rage, and a Russian guy stole it. So don't. Don't delete your Instagram account is the real lesson I have for you today. Um, if you want to get, uh, get at me there or come up to me, I have the blazer on. Uh, you might know me from making what is now called rubygems.org or gem cutter. I've talked a lot about that in the past. Not talking about that today, but happy to. Uh, if you have gem problems, I'll help you out. Uh, what I do now is I work for a company called Chatterbug. We're a language learning company that's based in San Francisco and Berlin. Uh, started by a few of the GitHub co-founders, and now we have a, few, a dozen people or so, and we're trying to teach languages. And I want to talk about this just a little. This is not a sales pitch, but I have to talk about it because it, it uh, well, it, they paid for me. And they also are, uh, it, it's going to help frame the problems that we're about to talk about. Uh, currently, we teach to English uh, speakers uh, three languages, uh, German, and then very soon, Spanish and French. And we have our cute little... Uh, Student bear on top and our tutor bear on the, or tutor owl on the bottom. Uh, so hopefully by the end of the year we're going to have kind of a, a marketplace type model where you oops, skip too far, uh, where we you could teach a language just by being a native speaker of English or French or whatever you know, and then you could learn another language. So that's kind of where we're going. Um, the cool thing about our platform is that if you ever use like a language learning app, you don't really get to speak it. So what we did is we kind of combined those like kind of memorization uh, type uh, apps with live lessons. So you actually have an in-person 45-minute session with another human being, a real human being, <laughs> and you talk in a different language. And uh, it is a really fun experience. I've done maybe 30 of them in both Spanish and, and German, and it is it's hard. <laughs> uh, I took Spanish in high school, and this is like this is a whole other level. You get to really, really learn. And this is all done from a tech side. We are all on Rails, uses WebRTC. Uh, we actually use Action Cable. We do like a cool little screen sharing and a chat thing. So we're all about it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do in the past year or so was have a mobile app. This is really important if you're on the run. You just want to look at some words to figure out to, or prepare for your next live lesson. We need a mobile app for that. And um, we are kind of looking at the state of APIs because we needed to start one from scratch. We had some APIs, but we really wanted to look at it. And we decided to look at GraphQL. And um, I'm going to talk about what GraphQL is today and a bunch of other uh, things that we ran into. So uh, if you don't know anything about GraphQL, you're going to get a great introduction in the next 30 minutes or so. Um, there's also a workshop tomorrow. I forget the exact time, but it's in your schedule. So if you really want to dig in, I would suggest signing up for that. But you're going to get a good intro for both. And thank you to the organizers so to moving stuff around so you could attend both. Um, I'm going to show you how you can use it in your app with some examples of how we did. And then I'm going to talk about some potential pitfalls that we ran into and are still running into. <laughs> pitfalls I'm digging ourselves out of. That's kind of the plan. OK, so uh, back to the problem. So the problem is I have a mobile app. I need to have it talk to my server. Uh, our server, in, as far as Rails goes, uh, just to set the, pr the context further, is very vanilla. Um, we use Rails 5.1, we use some Webpack and some React. Webpack is great, by the way. Um, and React, just like any app that's existed for any amount of time, <laughs> it's not all in React. Um, and then we have some JSON. Um, JSON is kind of, as we just heard, is kind of the lingua franca. Oh, that's a terrible language pun. Uh, 
<laughs> wow. Uh, and uh, we use a lot of JSON. We have a lot of JSON APIs. This is something that I think Rails does very well. You want to get started with the JSON uh, endpoint, you want to get some stuff on your page dynamically, it's great. Uh, I really like JSON. I'm about to really talk about why JSON's not good, so I want to make it really clear that I like JSON. It's a great format. Um, I think a lot of, if you've ever written and how to maintain an API that spits out JSON, a lot of the problems aren't really with JSON itself, it's actually with REST. <laughs> and this is funny uh, if you're listening to Dave's keynote because we were talking about how REST is a great thing that Rails did. However, there's a lot of problems with REST if you're writing an API. And those problems have kind of stacked up and this is a small smattering of them. Um, there's always kind of an endpoint end explosion. Uh, you have a lot of HTTP endpoints to maintain and worry about and your users must understand and you must support them, especially if someone is using it. Uh, round trips get really expensive, so if I'm, my network is really crappy and I'm trying to do a lot of fetches and requests, that makes your app experience worse. That means that you, you think your app is slower because it's grabbing all that data down and, and it might be actually expensive for your user too with data. Discoverability is low and I think this goes into like it's hard to discover about what the API does, but I think this speaks more to the developer experience is not as ideal as it possibly could be. And certainly backwards compatibility is not even thought about. I've given talks about, okay, we have to have an API v1 controller, or we need to, or of course every API has a different way of dealing with versions. This one talks in with a user agent, this one has an HTTP endpoint. None of that is built in with Rails. None of that is built in with JSON APIs. It's something you have to learn each and every time over and over again. So these problems all kind of stacked up and it leads to unhappiness. <laughs> um, it's something that I was, as I was looking at it, and this might be a problem that you've had, is like, okay, am I gonna deal with all this again? And the answer is, hopefully not. So let's talk about GraphQL. Um, I find myself to be a bit of a, so a, so a software historian. Uh, so I wanna talk about the history of GraphQL, but I feel that others in the, especially JavaScript community, have done a better job of it. So I'm gonna talk about just what matters to us in this room right now. Uh, the big point is it was started by Facebook in 2012 to implement their newsfeed, and it's kind of grown internally at Facebook from there. In 2015, they open sourced it. There's a fantastic documentation site for GraphQL and its JavaScript libraries, and there's other languages that have implemented it, such as Ruby, and in 2016. Uh, so the GraphQL Ruby driver has been around for two years-ish, and um, this is all the history that matters for right now. Um, if you need to go to your boss and be like, hey, I heard about this cool API thing, what other companies are using it? Uh, if you don't wanna talk about Facebook, because, well, they're not the best example right now. Um, <laughs> I don't know why, uh, I, I meant to mention <laughs> that uh, we have an amazing illustrator at Chatterbug. His name's Elvis Ferreri, and he's in, I'm probably mispronouncing his name because he's French. And uh, I don't know why he picked a Russian bear, but I really love it. <laughs> uh, I couldn't find an Octocat either, so my floating pizza holding uh, <laughs> octopus with a, with a fedora on, or who, who knows what that hat is. Uh, so GitHub's using it for their new API, and Shopify, which of course is a Canadian beaver. Um, <laughs> I love illustra uh, these illustrations. Um, Shopify uses it as well. So I would use, if you don't want to use the, uh, well, the, the company that's been having to deal with Congress, and testifying or the scrappy startup, you can be, hey, here's these other companies that are using it as well. Uh, just in general use cases, um, I think GraphQL really fits in well if you're doing a mobile app. Um, if you're starting one from scratch, React Native is co really nice. And um, there's this really great NPM package called Apollo that talks really well with, with GraphQL. Uh, same deal with if you're just doing a single page app. Um, also, I think in general to be that person, uh, anywhere a JSON API could be used, you could use GraphQL. You may not want to though, especially with how great Rails makes JSON APIs do. Now you could go full, full in and do it all from scratch, but I just wanna, I, and you, you can, but I would say you probably don't. I think the, the top two are really where it's best. What is GraphQL? I wanted to do this really early, and of course it's been nine minutes, but I keep talking, what is GraphQL? GraphQL is a query language. Uh, that means you build things like this. This is the query that you will build to ask your uh, server information. So your client on your phone or on your web page will build this thing, submit it to your server, and get back information. Uh, I'm gonna dig in to 
what this is, but basically in GraphQL parlance, I'm asking for a query, it has a current user field, and it's got a bunch of fields underneath it. It's got ID, login, all the junk I might need to show a dashboard maybe. Am I a student or not? Is it updated or not? And then underneath, I'm gonna have JSON. So we're, we're in home turf here. This is JSON. The real thing that's different is that query language, and that's the thing that you're building. Uh, of course, there's a lot of semantics and a lot of cool things that are tucked into it, and we're gonna talk about a little bit. Uh, but under the hood, you won't need to deal with this. If you're using a GraphQL client, they're gonna parse all this and give it back to you in the way that you need it. And uh, I just wanted to show that this is just JSON. This is not some new format that's invented. It is a new s way of asking for data, but it's not like a completely brand new thing. Under the hood, it's all JSON. All right, some basics. Uh, we've been talking about a, bit, a lot of basics. But let's go into it. Um, like I said, it's still JSON. Um, this is great because we're used to JSON with Rails. Um, this is the probably the most important thing is that it's strongly typed. Um, this means that all the input and the output are, in, you have to have a type for them. And if you've dealt with, okay, is this thing coming into my controller a Boolean? No, this jerk sent me a, a number. <laughs> and then you have to parse it and deal with it. Or dates especially are terrible in this way. Uh, any kind of string formats, uh, GraphQL handles all of that for you. It really enforces types. And I think as Rubyists, we know we like to say everything's an object. Well, in GraphQL, everything is a type, and I think that really jives well. Um, one of the great things about GraphQL is that it's change resilient. So um, I think this matters a lot because if you're maintaining an API over time, you will get changes to it. You have to say, okay, now I have a new requirement. I have to add this new thing in, and like it's kind of a pain to talk to your all the people using it and to make your clients adapt. And GraphQL has thought about how this, what the story for this is. And I think I really appreciate that. That from the start, it has a way to deal with those changes. And um, if you've ever had a lovely discussion with your engineering team about how, did, how do we do paging in the API? Do we have like a parameter? Do we do like headers? Do, well, like who, what, is, what does GitHub do, do? Do we care? Like stuff like that. You don't need to worry about that either. Uh, at least for the Ruby side API, if you're using Apollo, if you're using the Ruby gem, uh, paging is built in. That discussion's gone. And I think speaking from the Rails point of view of convention over configuration, this is great that your engineering team doesn't have to spend cycles on worrying about how do we get more data when there's more than we can handle. It's done. And then uh, if typing is my uh, the most important thing, I think the introspection built into GraphQL is my favorite thing. Um, Everything that you build with GraphQL is inherently uh, ins inspectable. Um, there's a great little uh, in console that comes with the Ruby gem as well. It's a separate gem, actually. Uh, but then everything that you get to query and mess around with is kind of dynamic. You get to play with it right in your browser. You get to make build those queries and get the responses back. If you've ever had to build something using curl or a Nick or build your own little HTTP client just to test out an API, this has it. You don't need to write that anymore. Okay, so let's, uh, let's keep talking about basics. Um, this might look familiar uh, for a request if you ever used, um, I believe, any of those WS Death Star things or something like uh, XML RPC, any of these envelope formats. This is a pretty common pattern that used to exist pre-Rails and kind of stills around. And we're back to treating requests with GraphQL as it treats HTTP kind of like a dumb tunnel. So this is, has its, its benefits and its, and its uh, drawbacks. Uh, the big benefit is that uh, it's pretty simple to talk about. Uh, that query that we wrote is, gets posted to your server and then it returns JSON. That's how it is for everything with GraphQL. Uh, obviously this is not REST. That's something I want to be very clear about, that this is not REST anymore. Uh, this is treating HTTP just as a way to get data in and out. Everything else, we have the query language to describe. So that's something that uh, is kind of jarring for me, for especially, I think it's jarring for others as well that may be used to how Rails works, is that we're not in that land anymore. But the nice thing is that we solve a lot of those problems that we talked about by implementing something different. So this is something we're not, re re we're reconsidering the basics. <laughs> so this is a lot to reconsider. But I want to be very clear about this, that this is, we kind of lose the like really nice HTTP semantics. And I actually think that's a downside. The fact that we can't use get requests the way that they should be used is, I think, a big drawback. And I hope that changes, honestly. 
So that's how GraphQL requests happen. You build that query, it gets posted, it comes back. All right, let's talk about types. What do types look like? I love this bear too. <laughs> I, actually, this is a raccoon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> fun story about this, uh, we, our German mascot, a chatterbug, which I have stickers by the way, and you can come up and grab them, but he's a, uh, he's a raccoon, which is actually not, um, <laughs> not native to Germany. <laughs> And I suggested, like, let's make him a squirrel. Like, it'd be so easy. We just add a tail or, like, a different thing. It'll be really easy. And they're like, no, 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 he's a He's a raccoon immigrant to Germany. And we're like, okay, I can't argue with that. <laughs> so anyway, that's Otto. I don't know why he's so why he's trying to sell you different badges. But, um, <laughs> uh, okay, so types. Types are um, key to GraphQL. Uh, this means that all input and output must be a type. That mean when I ask for data, there's a type. When I get data back, there's a type. Um, the cool thing about this is that there's no more validation. So if you've had to write validations that you have to shove the input or output into the certain way, GraphQL handles that, and I really, really like that. Every app is going to have a mix of these three types, um, and these are from the Ruby parlance. So I'm saying uh, when I ask for data, so the equivalent of a GET request, I'm getting a query type. Uh, when I ask for a change to data, so that would be posts, puts, deletes, that's my mutation type. And arguments are strongly typed as well. So we'll see an example of this. When I ask for data to be changed, I pass along a type that is strongly typed with those arguments. So this takes the place of uh, strong parameters, which is really cool. So actually all the stuff that's in your input object types are the only things that are allowed into the mutation. So that, we don't even need strong parameters here because the query language that we're requesting data with enforces it. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> um, our app, for example, we have, uh, this is super simple example, but you most likely might have one if you start using GraphQL. We have a user type, that's a query type we can ask for. We have an update user mutation type, which is a mutation type. And that takes as an argument a user input type. So uh, these are just simple examples. You'll see we have, a few dozen types by now, and your app will have a bunch. They're kind of like the, the, the models, so to speak. Um, I mentioned that GraphQL is, in, is inspectable, and um, it comes with a tool called GraphIQL, which I really think will change the way you write APIs, because it's changed the way I have and everyone on my team has. Uh, basically, and I know this is hard to read, you get free API docs. Um, not only do you get the console, where you get to write the queries and then run them, and it keeps a history, and it has a nice little way to like, nice. Uh, it has a nice little way of uh, of, um, sh of like making your code pretty so you can paste it and complain why a, co why a query's not working. But it, it also comes with documentation. So when you're writing your GraphQL types, side by side with that is the documentation that is shown to your users and your team. And you could put this publicly. Uh, I'm trying to figure that out how we can do that without <laughs> letting someone get access to all the other data. Uh, but at least for your team internally, this is a huge, huge leg up if you've ever had to deal with, okay, how do we communicate all these changes inside the team for different, for different endpoints? We've got it solved. We've got a way to, to deal with that. Um, I can't express enough that like GraphIQL is really, really nice. If you've ever ha dealt with an API, like Stripe's got a really good one. There's a lot of different APIs that give you this kind of playground sandbox, and you get it for free. Okay. I talked about changes. GraphQL deals well with changes. Um, this means you won't have to version your API anymore, um, which is cool. Uh, you could have a v1 API endpoint for GraphQL, but chances are you won't need a v2. Um, instead, the, the, the saying you'll hear in a lot of the docs is that you'll extend with graphs. So what does that mean? Uh, let's say I've got a new data model. Um, I can, uh, on my phone now, Okay, I've logged in, I show my dashboard, but how do I show my upcoming live lessons? Well, I can start plugging in new fields right underneath. Obviously, this is very similar to JSON. I could just start plugging fields in, but the cool thing is that GraphQL gives you uh, the ability to be resilient to change in the opposite direction as well. So I, if that was no longer a way I wanted to ask for appointments, I could mark that field as deprecated. That shows up in Graph IQL, and then I can say that I have one new way of telling my team, okay, here's how, don't use this query, use this one instead. Um, so it kind of goes in both directions. Instead of just one direction, which JSON APIs only ever go in one direction. Um, okay, so upcoming appointments. Um, and the cool thing too is that we can keep extending. You, you can kind of nest stuff. So this is also how we reduce 
round trips is that you can say, okay, in inside of the same query, I can plug in all the data that I need. Also, inside of, this, inside of the same GraphQL request, because we are handling it at HTTP as a dumb tunnel, I can say, plug in multiple queries. Your client can start to get smarter with plugging in queries and mutations and batching up all the stuff it needs at the same time. So this gets, I, don't, I didn't cover all of this with code examples, but the, the rabbit hole is really deep. They really thought about how to, how to make it work well. Um, so to, to plug away on this example a little more, so I'm asking for upcoming appointments. Maybe that would be in JSON API world another endpoint that I would go fetch. And then uh, I also want to show when it starts and if it's like a German or a Spanish lesson. And all of that I can just keep plugging away. Um, for those of you with a security mindset, you might be saying, okay, can't you just like keep nesting things infinitely and then like blow up the parser? And the answer is yes, but don't do that. <laughs> um, but you can turn that, you can basically say only accept nesting up to a certain level. Um, and just like before, I wanted to show this off is that uh, under the hood, it's JSON. And I think this matters a lot because it's not some other weird data format, it's just JSON. So if you were wa running this query in the Graph IQL Q QL inspector, you open up the web inspector, you would see that query go through and this data come back. Okay, so I just talked about all the stuff that GraphQL has and I'm at 20 minutes, so I'm gonna talk briefly about this. There's no data model in GraphQL. Uh, this is kind of a no-brainer for us in the Rails community because you use Action Controller and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use Active Record, but I think for other communities this matters a lot. So this is just something that is kind of uh, needs to be said is that GraphQL gives you a way for data to come in and then you write the glue that goes from there to your database or where, whatever your data layer is. It does not have authorization, it does not have authentication. So it does not have a way to say, hey, let this admin do or do not this certain thing, this certain mutation, and it certainly does not have a way built in to say, okay, this user only has access to this stuff and you don't. So that's something I'm gonna talk about that more. And it doesn't have caching, and I have good news about that, because that kind of stinks. We're used to caching just working the way it does with Rails, and it should work with this too. Okay, so to wrap it up with just the basics, GraphQL way. You can evolve your server and your client at the same time, especially if you're in a place where you're iterating really fast, such as we have been with a mobile app, very important. Uh, you get to introspect it all, and this matters a ton compared if you've ever had to do a lot of API work. In order to get it all visible, it's not easy. And uh, one of the cool things is that you get to kind of shape your data, and I didn't cover this too much, but one of the cool features it has is that you get to kind of, the client gets some leeway with how the data is requested as well. So this is something that if you've written a client, you've probably had to do. It's like, oh, this endpoint just comes in a different way and the client gets to have actual say about that with, with GraphQL, which is great. So this is uh, the, kind of a classic, uh, the previous thing was Legos and this is now Play-Doh. I mean, you can kind of accomplish the same things, but it's kind of cool. All right, using it in our app. Uh, we have a lot of characters. This is our Spanish character. <laughs> Her name is Maria Dolores de Barriga. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's a llama, and this is our Spanish character. Um, so if you want the docs for GraphQL, they're at graphql-ruby.org. Wonderful, wonderful site. Um, I want to remind you that we're off the golden path here for Rails. There's no controllers, there's no views, which I'm as nervous as Maria about this. Um, <laughs> uh, that means instead we have the GraphQL DSL. So um, this means we are provided a DSL uh, by the gem, and that's how we write our GraphQL types. I'm gonna show you how to do that really fast. Um, we install the gem really easily. You also will definitely want the Graph IQL Rails gem. You don't need it, but geez, get it. Um, and then there's a generator, of course. Uh, the generator will plug a bunch of stuff in, uh, the most important of which um, is the thing you're dealing with the day-to-day -day basis is the tree. And uh, if we look at the GraphQL folder, it, it makes, it makes uh, a schema and then a folder for mutations and a folder for types. So that's just the place where you can plug in all the ways that you change data and ask for data. The schema is kind of your root file, um, the root routes. Um, it's the place that by default that says, hey, here's my just my basic query type that's gonna have the queries that are accessible and here's my mutation as well. You can get more complicated than this. The schema has a lot of stuff that the GraphQL site uh, on Facebook uh, that Facebook's GraphQL site has, but by default, you're gonna get something that looks just like this in your app. This is also the place where you plug in instrumentation. Uh, 
uh, that's also the place where you get in, uh, the instrumentation and logging. It's kind of like the initializer and the and the wrapper. Cody and Mike, all right, I guess I'm stuck. I I'm gonna gesticulate wildly back here. Um, how do we uh, do types? Um, uh, we have a name, we have fields, and we have a description. So for example, for my language, I have, uh, it's my language type or my user type. Uh, I have different fields, such as my user. I have a login field, an email field, updated at, and then a description. Obviously for user and language, that's really simple, but for a description, uh, maybe I've got a different model that needs more documentation. You can, you can get it right there. Each field has stuff as well. You have a name. Login is very obvious. Uh, arguments, which is super cool. Um, instead of doing uh, query parameters on your API, each field, each individual field can take arguments as well. So if you ever wanted like a slice of data in a weird way, but you don't want to provide like a query string to it, you just want this one individual thing, you can do that now. Um, it has a resolver, um, and this is just it's like a resolve function. I'm going to show off what that is. But this is the place where you will actually write the code that connects GraphQL to your app. And then a description. And this makes uh, perfect sense for uh, name and login and email, those kind of fields that make sense. But for something like upcoming appointments, you might want to say like, oh, this is all the appointments 20 in the next 24 hours. And then that would show up on GraphIQL and from there. What does this look like? So let's look at a super simple query. Uh, here's a query for the German language and the its name. I don't know why I'm asking for this, just here we go. Uh, from the Ruby side, it's gonna look like this. We have a field uh, that's called German language. I'm asking for a strong type back called language type, and then I have a resolve function uh, with three arguments. The object coming in, any arguments, which both of those are nothing uh, right now, and a context. A context is kind of uh, the global object that's given to all resolve functions. So instead of controllers, instead of views, this is what you get. You get the DSL. Um, the D inside of the resolve function, you can write any of the code that you need, such as, in our case, we're gonna look up with Active Record and find the language of the code of DE. Now from there, you're saying, okay, how do I get a language type? And the GraphQL gem has a bunch of metaprogramming stuff that figures out how to connect the two. You don't need to worry about it. Instead, you just write a language type, which says, okay, I'm gonna take a language, and I'm gonna say I have a field name on it, that is a string, and here's my description of it. And I might have other fields. I could have other fields in here with resolve functions. You could have really whatever you would like inside of this GraphQL type. By default, it's gonna map properties that are the same name. So if I give it an active record object with name, and it's, I've got a type with the name, it's gonna find it. Great. Uh, let's look at a mutation fast. Uh, mutations, uh, this is an example of the GraphQL language. So I'm gonna, instead of query, I ask for mutation. It takes update user, and this looks kind of JSON-ish. Um, so I'm saying my user has a time zone of UTC. And it's kind of, that's how arguments are done. It's kind of a, a parens inside of a field. And then it returns a type as well. So typically with a JSON API, we would see like, okay, returning true, or I'm returning a created response, or accept, or 200 okay. And with GraphQL, you're returning a type. This is not, we're not in normal REST world. You can return the type that you just did, and then your client can react appropriately, such as, hey, I can say that I updated my type uh, to UTC now, or whenever, or I keep a log. Um, the cool thing, this is kind of where I'm getting to the shape of data as well, is that uh, your client may not need every single field from your user type when doing an action such as this. So you only have to get the stuff that you want back uh, that is relevant to this API request which is super cool. In JSON world, we'd have to just return the whole thing and then, well, you, deal, you just kind of discard the rest of it. Uh, mutations have a little DSL as well. So we can say, okay, let's have an update user field. It returns user type. It takes an argument of a user input type and then here's our friendly resolve function. Uh, inside of our resolve function, uh, we look up the global uh, context for the user and then we call update attributes bang. Uh, now, the, the security-minded folks might be saying, okay, where am I validating my input? And that is happening in the user input type. So I can say just exactly what I am allowed to have changes with with, the arc, with my uh, user input type. So if that just has, t I think just for us, it's like time zone and like one or two other things. So if there's no possibility of something happening where it's like, okay, could I promote myself to an admin in this way? Could I change my password digest field or some weird stuff, because that's simply not in the user input type. If it's not in that input type, it won't parse, it's not a valid query, reject it. All of that stuff is written for you. You don't, you 
Strong parameters is a thing of the past in GraphQL. Um, like I said, uh, authentication is good. I know I'm at 30 minutes, I'm gonna keep going. Uh, authentication is not built in. Um, instead, you can enforce it via the controller, and I would highly recommend doing this in your app. Um, and you pass a current user. So don't do this at the GraphQL level, at that resolve function level. Do this at the controller level. When you run the generator, it will uh, give you uh, the, all the tools you need with Rails to do it, such as this. It looks just like this. You'll have an API GraphQL controller. You can say, hey, let me find the current user from my HTTP token or whatever your OAuth, basic auth setup is for your API, and then I can call whatever H HTTP Rails, whatever authentication system you need. Don't do this inside of GraphQL. It'll be a mess. Um, same deal with authorization, there's nothing built in, but the uh, GraphQL Ruby maintainer has a uh, pro version of the gem, which you can pay him, and then you will get access to those features, which I think is a great business model. Or there's other gems for Garden Pundit, and you could do this yourself if you need to. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about testing. Um, integration tests are super hard uh, with GraphQL, but not impossible. Um, I would really recommend that you test custom logic. So that means the stuff that's just inside of your resolve functions. And then treat the types, treat the types that they map to the right thing, that they get parsed in the right way, treat that like framework code. It's not the best idea with Rails to test a belongs to works or test, hey, my post model has many comments. That's not super worth it. But I think in here we wanna test the same deal. We can trust that the types do what they are built to do and then we can test the stuff inside of resolve functions and especially mutations. Um, mutations actually can be taken out into s completely separate classes, which I think is a great little object-oriented design pattern that's inside of the GraphQL Ruby library. If you notice, our call function for this GraphQL uh, function has the exact same arguments as our resolve function. So this call takes input args context, same three things. That means this class can be, can be instantiated outside of the world of GraphQL. For example, in a simple test case, I could say, hey, can I make sure I change the info I need? I fire up just that function, not all of the framework around GraphQL, and then make sure I test the thing that you need. So anything that takes arguments, anything that takes a mutation, this is a super good pattern. Um, you can integration test as well. So if you've written integration tests with other APIs, this is how you could do it here. I just wanted to briefly show that it is possible. I don't think the code is as important here, but uh, you can say, hey, just testing simple things, especially integra uh, integration with your authentication system is very important. Uh, you can also say, hey, uh, let me pass in headers. So just this is a standard Rails integration test. This is honestly the only integration test I have. I mostly have unit tests for specific functions. Okay, back on track. Let's talk about some potential pitfalls. This is Jean, I think she's our French mascot. She's very French. Um, one of the things that we kind of ran into early, and you will as well, is that there's nothing built in to handle errors in GraphQL, and this is bewildering to me. Um, I don't know why it's like this, but if you want to have, let's say you submit something, something went wrong, even a 500 request or a, four, or a 400 type deal, uh, there's not a built-in way to do that. I don't know why, but you will want this gem, which gives you a rescue from block. So if something in your code throws a uh, uh, active record not valid error, or um, a not found if you pass the wrong ID, uh, that will kind of blow up, unless if you have this gem. So this is a super good gem to get. Um, this is one of the things, just like the HTTP semantics, that I wish would change soon. Um, like I said, she's very French. <laughs> um, something to keep in mind is that resolve functions are not sequential. Uh, since we have these functions, one of the cool things built into the API is that um, you kind of get to load them asynchronously. This is really cool because it lets you do different things with your API. Uh, but the problem is that n plus ones are real. We are back in the land of uh, dealing with performance problems. Uh, luckily, Shopify, our Canadian friends, have uh, built a GraphQL-batch gem, which allows you to batch up several resolve functions and run them as one thing. Um, this also is based on the Facebook data loader uh, NPM package, which does the exact same pattern. It's that I'm going to take a bunch of things, in our case baguettes, that might have common IDs. You might have dealt with this problem at your work. And uh, hey, I've got repeats here, okay. Uh, this is super slow to ask for eight separate things. How about I do one giant baguette instead? Uh, so this gem does that as a pattern. And one of the things that I was finding was that it's, uh, it has a lot of great patterns wrapped up in that readme and in various like gifs and stuff. So I put them in one gem. <laughs> Uh, so this is something I'm going to release today. I didn't. I was too busy listening to the last talk, 
Uh, all the goodies that I'm about to talk about are gonna be in a gem called CacheQL, and uh, that'll be released very, very soon, uh, once I get some internet access. Um, so, yay, <laughs> this is progressing. Uh, this gem has four things, which is pretty cool. Uh, the, the first thing is uh, it has these loaders, which are the batch loaders provided by Shopify, and some other uh, companies wrote them as well, that lets you do co uh, solve common performance problems, such as foreign keys. Let's say I've got an object that belongs to a language. Well, if I have a resolve function that asks, that does a single query, it's gonna build up to an N plus one. So this lets, it has a record loader that does just foreign keys. It has another one for polymorphic keys. If you have a lot of po polymorphic keys in your app, which they're everywhere. Um, there's another one for associations as well, which is great. So um, this is a great way if once you're deep in the GraphQL and you're starting to figure out, okay, what's going on performance-wise? Why are these things slow? Batching is the way to go. It took me too long to figure that out. Um, caching, let's talk about caching briefly. Uh, oop, too far. Uh, we're not in HTTP REST land, sadly. So that means stuff like HTTP e tags is out the window and this I'm not happy about. I feel like those semantics are awesome and I feel like probably get should be supported. So this is something I would love to see change from the GraphQL level. So what do we have instead? We have good old Rails.cache, which if you're using Rails 5.2, which just got released last week, there's Redis as well. So hopefully you've got Redis or Memcache hooked up to your app. You can cache all sorts of stuff, great. Uh, what, how do we do with that, or what do we do with it? Well, we wanna store the results of the, re of the resolve functions. And um, let's say you've got a slow resolve function. I need to stick it in a cache somewhere. I've got you. You can just stick cache QL in front of the resolve function lambda and then you're good and it will cache that expensive operation uh, based on object.cache key and I think there's an expiration time that you can configure as well. So this is great. This is kind of just like our uh, cache in active action view in, in that you can say, okay, now I've got a cached uh, function. Perfect and you'll be able to watch your stuff get faster. So this is the second thing that's in that cache QL gem. Uh, there's two other things that are related to instrumentation. Uh, this is something that you'll have to do, this is a very common pitfall, is that you have to say, I've got slow stuff, how do I figure out what's slow and how to make it faster? Um, also, I love that we had an illustration of a graph. <laughs> I don't know why we were teaching graphs, but I love it. Um, Apollo Engine is kind of the community standard for this. Uh, this is uh, a separate company that does application metrics, and it, uh, there is a Ruby gem as well that you can plug in, and it gives you a development proxy that will proxy requests through it that I have not run on production yet. So, oh no. There we go. Uh, the thing that we use in production is Scout APM, which is a competitor to New Relic. I'm sorry if there's New Relic folks in the audience. Um, and I wrote an implementation for uh, uh, Instrumenter for Scout, and uh, my gem includes a Rails.logger uh, Instrumenter as well. So what do those two look like? Um, Scout, if you use Scout, and this is hard to read, but in the middle, it break, it, if you use the uh, instrumenter that's in the CacheQL gem, it will start breaking out GraphQL uh, resolve functions into their own uh, block for you to analyze inside of Scout. And this is super useful. It's kind of take, peeling back the covers and figuring out what is going on inside of my request and what, which resolve functions are slow. Uh, you can figure that out now, which is super cool. So that's the third thing. The fourth thing is that if you don't wanna use any of that, if you don't wanna use Apollo Engine, you don't wanna use Scout yet, or you can't convince your boss to install it, uh, which is possible, um, we have a Rails.logger uh, instrumenter for you, which uses active support notifications. You basically just hook it up, and then you start getting logs on your GraphQL requests. So this is great. You can jump back and forth between, okay, I'm gonna run this request in GraphIQL, that might be slow, and then pop right to your Rails log and look at how slow things are. And then hopefully maybe add some caching in, do whatever you need to with batching, figure out how to make it faster. So this is a super common thing, and now we have a way to tackle it. Uh, so let's sum up. Is this the new way for uh, JSON APIs in Rails? And uh, there's this law with headlines where if there's a question at the end of the, the headline, the answer is probably no. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna let the reader decide. Um, I think this is gonna be really hard for you for GraphQL if your app logic is super coupled. I wanted to talk about this more, uh, but I kind of cut it for time. Uh, I think that if you don't have clear defined layers between how you present HTML and JSON as they are, 
and your app's logic, if you don't have some middle presenter data server, whatever you want to call it, if you don't have that middle layer, you're going to have a really hard time with GraphQL if it's, if it's an existing Rails project. So you really need to consider how your app's architected and if it can handle adding a whole slew of new semantics to it. Uh, I think for fresh apps, though, this is a great solution, and especially for new APIs. If you're trying to look for a new API that's going to really uh, be around for a while, I think that this is a safe bet now. We have larger companies that are using it. It's shown that changes are very easy and possible, and it gives a great developer experience. And especially for fresh apps, the integration with um, Apollo, and if you're using React Native, or even if you're not, if you're just doing this uh, in, in browser app, it's really, really, really nice. That's all I've got. Um, thank you. <laughs>